Welcome, everyone. Today, we're talking to Greg Sawicki, an associate professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology in the School of Mechanical Engineering. Greg is known as an expert on the interactions between human biomechanics, physiology, and neural control. He helps us understand not just how and where exoskeletons might be useful, but why. And now, Greg Sawicki. Hi, Greg. How you doing? I'm doing really well, Josh. Good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, agreed. Thanks for joining the podcast. So you've inspired and influenced my work over the years quite a bit. Uh, so it's a real honor to get to interview you. Um, you've done such a wide range of work from experiments on rats to developing product like exoskeletons. So I was hoping you could kick us off with uh, a general overview of your career so far. Yeah, well, I, I guess I'll start off with how I got interested in wearable robotics in the first place. I did my undergraduate mechanical engineering at Cornell and quickly realized I didn't want to work on planes, trains, or cars uh, like through the first couple of years of my time. Um, and really that was because I took some courses that I consider to be like formative decision points in my track. One was with Andy Ruina, who's famous in the world of passive dynamic walking. Um, and, you know, he, he had some examples in his course that demonstrated pretty clearly that dynamics and physics principles could be used to understand movement. And it, I've, I've been an athlete for my whole life, not professional by any means, but um, a runner, a baseball player, uh, any kind of ball sport you can imagine. And so that's really, really what piqued my interest was the ability to use math and, and engineering to kind of understand why I was bad at it, I guess. <laughs> Some other people fit, use it to figure out why they're good at it, but I, I I quickly got interested in the idea of optimizing human movement using math and science um, sophomore year of my undergrad. And then later in my undergraduate career, I got to, um, I did a concentration in bio, uh, biology, which let me take electives uh, around campus that were sort of outside engineering. And another formative point was uh, some coursework I did in the vet school with John Bertram, who is a, a famous comparative uh, biomechanist. And that's where I first sort of saw the anatomy under the skin of animals, non-human animals in this case. And that got me intrigued in sort of the structure function realm of biomechanics, like how how, engin how engineered parts were quite different than, than biological parts, like actuators, muscles, etc., and then, um, man, fast forward to my PhD years, I guess, uh, where I had the chance to build robots for bodies to improve performance. And then so fast forward then I, um, to postdoc years where I really got back into muscle physiology and I worked on frog jumping and bipedal bird running. And that let me sort of view muscles in the context of movement um, under the skin. And then I opened my own lab in 2009, I guess it was, at uh, University of North Carolina and NC State. And the mission of that lab was to, we called it Physiology of Wearable Robotics. That's still the name of our lab. So it was really to try to understand how engineered systems and physiological systems merge and how best we can build things that, I guess, help humans get around the constraints of their own body. And so here we are today, we're still working on similar problems now at Georgia Tech. I also uh, have a, an appointment at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition in Pensacola, which is where I'm sitting right now. I come here once a month for a few days, and I, I spend a day a week or so working with some roboticists here. But the mission is still to you know build robots that can be symbiotic, if you will, with human physiology and, and make, make, a, make a sum that's better than the parts, I guess, in terms of function. Fascinating. Maybe that was long-winded, but there you go. There's the trajectory in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I learned a few things I didn't know before, and it's it's really cool how you've sort of bridged the this the squishy side of this field uh, with the the kind of more rigid engineering side. Uh, you, have, you have a very unique perspective on how uh, humans and these machines interact. I, you know, as a younger uh, as an undergrad and before hated the idea of dissecting animals and, and going under the skin. So it, it's always been kind of hard for 
me and I think most engineers to kind of uh, appreciate uh, some of the aspects that you work with every day. I, w- I wanted to ask, and, and I've kind of framed many of the podcast uh, episodes uh, in this series so far, trying to get your perspective on sort of grand challenges uh, in wearable uh, robotics today. And I, I, I can kind of see where your work uh, has been heading recently, where you're um, kind of doing experiments with a lot of the kinds of devices and technology that many of us are, are working with, but you're kind of, again, going under the skin uh, in a way that I, I think is really unique. So maybe you could share a little bit with our listeners about like the sort of the unexplored frontier uh, that you see yeah. under the skin and how the unique insights that you're measuring in our lab or in your lab are going to, you know, kind of enable the next uh, wave yeah. of technology development. Yeah, I, lo- I love the question. This is this is why I get up each day, right? Is like, oh, what's the next grand challenge and how can we chip away at it? I guess like the way we frame it in my group and in my interactions with colleagues uh, and in grant proposals and all the things we do is I try to think of a continuum of... <laughs> It's going to sound weird, but a space-time continuum, right? And so, like, what we tr- what we try to do is get to the edges of, in the time spectrum, it would be, like, how can an exoskeleton provide assistance on very short time scales on the one hand versus very long time scales on the other? And I think the w- I like to frame along the time axis in that way because most of what we've done as a field so far, all incredibly useful work, by the way, I'm not trying to knock what's happened to this point, has been you know, on the order of minutes or maybe, you know, in some cases, hundreds of minutes, but we don't know really what, what an exoskeleton does on the order of say milliseconds, like at the level of reflexes. And we don't know a lot about what exoskeletons can do if they became, you know, part of our clothing over very long time scales. Every single day we put it on like, like our pants or our shirt. What does that actually do to the underlying musculoskeletal system? over very long time scales, right? So so I, for me, the grand challenges along the time axis are, are those. How do we begin to do experiments where we understand the shortest time scales? And there, you know, the way we're thinking about it now is, is literally the reflex pathways. So what doesn't, what, what, does, what do the mechanical loads that an exo puts on your body when you use it? due to the feedback signals that go to your spinal cord and how does that maybe influence things like balance or the ability to recover from from an from a push or a pull or a slip on the other hand the long term effects really i think that one's in some ways even more challenging because we don't still yet have a lot of products that people can wear every day but if we could have those products or in-house research tools I would want to know, you know, come into the lab or clinic every week and we're going to look at how is your muscle strength changing? How do the tissue tissue properties of your Achilles tendon or other tendons change? Do the fiber types that we see in your muscles change from, say, fast to slow twitch? And there, there there's an interesting merging between wearable robotics and the exercise science world. People who are studying what exercise does to the body. And I actually think there's an opportunity for exoskeletons there to be sort of like a wearable gym, which is also counter to the intuition when we started out as a field, which was like, these things can reduce effort. We built a lot of devices that increased effort and we called those failures. Uh, I see that as an opportunity now to provide small doses of exercise over long time frames as a way to keep our bodies healthy. So those are just a couple examples along the sort of, uh, I guess, the temporal axis from uh, milliseconds to years. There are opportunities, again, at the ends of that spectrum, the milliseconds and the over years, I think that we need to start paying more attention to. So I, I like the spectrum and, and thinking about the extremes, I think is helpful. On the milliseconds uh, end of the spectrum, could you perhaps elaborate on uh, sort of the unique paradigm that you are operating in? I mean, you're using some technologies that I think 
are, are pretty cutting edge. You know, not everybody might be familiar with. And you know, how do you structure experimental protocol around those technologies to, you know, generate insights? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, the work we have going on at, at short time scales right now um, in humans will would be things like we we have a system called the Karen in our lab. It's a long acronym that I can never remember, but it's a the company is that developed it is, is called Notech. And what, what the system is, is it's a, um, no, it's a, it's a human scale shaker essentially. So it's two force plat. It's like a split belt treadmill for people who don't know what that is. It's a, it's a treadmill with two belts and inside each of those belts, we can measure the forces that the legs put onto the ground. So we know sort of a little bit about the physics. This thing sits in a, a motion capture volume so we can get the motions of the segments of the body. If we have forces in motion, we can make estimates about what muscles are doing under the skin to create torques or moments around the joints. And that's incredibly useful. But what's cool about this tool is not the, I guess, capability to do inverse dynamics, but to do it in the context where we would, you know, literally shake or pull the rug out from is more what we've been doing recently. We simulate a, a ground translation. We don't simulate it. We apply a ground translation that's very rapid um, at an unexpected time during the gait cycle. And we can do it very with very precise timing during a, a gait cycle. Um, and then we can do it kind of coming from any direction in the in the world. So I can pull a rug from behind you and pitch you forward. I can pull a rug from in front of you and pitch you backwards. And I can do this around sort of a compass, north, south, east, west, and, and anything in between. And then I can do it at different displacements, so I can make it more or less challenging. And the third thing I can do is do it at a specific time during the gate. So, so if you take that experimental tool, you can understand what humans do on a, on a I don't know, perturbation recovery uh, axis in a very general way. And then you can ask whether or not a wearable robot can improve the performance in that space, right? And these things have to operate at very fast, you know, reflex scale um, times in order, we think, this is a central hypothesis that we're currently testing, is if you can use a machine that doesn't have the physiological delays, which by the way, like, our bodies are awesome, but they're pretty slow in terms of the ability to transmit um, signals in the nervous system. We're talking about hundreds, a hundred millisecond delay is the typically stated delay for like an ankle muscle trying to respond in a reflexive way. As the engineers on the, the, who are listening know, like we that can be theoretically speed of light, right? If you have <laughs> if you have good wires. And you have motors that are responsive. And of course, it's not infinitely fast, but it's faster than a 100 millisecond delay. So we see that as an opportunity. If we could replace a slow biological system with a faster engineered system, we should be able to have better balance, right? And so that, so, okay, so that's an example of putting a bunch of tools together, um, only one of which is an EXO right? The key to those experiments is actually the experimental apparatus uh, to try and build systems that have superhuman balance. And I suppose this would be especially useful for someone who's got compromised balance or slower circuits or what have you. Yeah, we think so. So like we're, we're, we'll try this um, on people who are, are stroke survivors. Uh, also people with, with just generalized weakness in their, in their lower limb. And actually, we're we're interested in fatigue also. So so Josh, if you if you do a bunch of squat thrusts in your in your job, say you have to lift things over and over again, and then you're gonna walk down the factory floor to the bathroom, and the floor is slippery. Your fatigued system is gonna fall more often because you're not as responsive. And so there's an opportunity there also for technology to help you. Do you? Uh... In, in these experimental paradigms, um, I mean, you, you seem to have a particular interest in, in exoskeletons, but I guess I'm, I'm curious about two things. 
uh, on one hand, the the engineered system that you're referring to, I mean, need not be wearable. You could you could even have um, I don't know. I could imagine an experiment where you're wearing a, a harness that helps you, or um, I don't know, a system with wheels that that could help uh, with with some of these challenges. So I'm curious if you've if it, if you've explored that sort of beyond the confines of the wearable uh, robot. And then um, you also, getting to your points about long time scales, um, you mentioned, you know, we don't have exoskeletons that you uh, can wear every day yet, but we do have clothing. We do have prosthetics. We do have wearable products that are, have been around for a while. Um, so I'm curious if you've explored in that direction too at all. Yeah, good questions. I mean, we we haven't explored really any of those things, but I think they're all good ideas. So your idea about it not needing to be a uh, a wearable thing that puts torques on your body is totally true. Like it could be an external force that comes from a a human crane system. This would be particularly useful in a clinic during training, or it could be on a factory floor where there is an overhead robotic cabling system that you strap yourself into that keeps you from falling over and things like that. And I think um, the, a similar paradigm to what we're doing in, in the lab c- could be applied where the recovery strategy is applied as a force somewhere on the body rather than torques around the joints, certainly. You know this well. You, you work at Humotech. You're the CEO of Humotech, and Humotech's got a robot that has cables that could be connected to a person to sort of suss out how that uh, laboratory-based system that applies forces to the body anywhere really could be used, right, to keep people from falling. So so that's that's the other place where this could be useful is on like a dangerous construction site. So you can think of lots of applications where the robot isn't necessarily wearable, but still is doing the same kinds of things to keep people upright. Yeah, the long-term, you know, the experiment that we did recently that addresses long term was actually a modified shoe, right? And this is this is inspired a, a little bit by I think some of the things that you thought about with with others like Peter Adamchik and Steve Collins, who are in the wearables world. So you, there, there's this question about long term use in exos that I think is still unanswered and important. So I I get the question still. Most of the times when I give a lecture somewhere, a smart person in the audience will say, hey, you're just, you know, like you're offloading the body and this is just basically like sending someone to space, right? Like they're they're just going to atrophy. And then if if their device breaks, they're going to be in a tough spot because they have a skeleton that's not strong enough and muscles that are too weak. And my response used to be, damn, they got me, like. And now my response is, well, actually, we don't really know what exoskeletons do to behavior. So it could be that when you make something easier for someone, they choose to move more, right? And this sort of central idea has been floating around for a decade now in conversations with folks like you, or it could be Steve Collins or Elliot Rouse or Aaron Young or Dan Ferris or pick your favorite wearables person. And the problem is that we can't do the experiment because we don't have devices that can go out for that long. We're starting to get there, I think. So what do you do? Well, you got to get creative. Like, is a shoe a wearable robot? Meh. Nah. Marathoners think so. I mean, you can you can get a pretty good performance improvement just by good shoe design. So we got to thinking, well, let's try to make some shoes that might simulate the context in which the muscle tendons are when you're in a robot. So we made people very steep high heels and we made people very steep toe heels, I guess. Hmm. And we had them walk in these wacky shoes for 14 weeks. And it wasn't about metabolic cost. It was about what happens to the structures underlying the skin. Do their muscles get more volume or do their tendons get stiffer? We, of course, related that to things like energy cost. And we're in the analysis phase, so I, I don't really have like any results to share other than, yes, things change over a 14-week period when you just put someone in a different shoe. But people also, their activity levels change quite a bit. 
in our case, people walked less because these shoes were really weird. But if it was a robot that helped you move, maybe you would move more, right? So this is all just to say that behavioral, like cognitive neuroscience and behavioral science are going to be more and more important if, and we, we should have known this sooner to what we do as wearable roboticists. And, and it's because we need to understand how these technologies change people's behavior, really. How they go about their day, their day. Do they choose to take the stairs versus the, you know, versus the straight path? Or would they rather go on the elevator? Things like this are incredibly important. So that's like way out to the, this is now also not just the long time scale, but it's also on the spatial scale. What do people do not just on a treadmill or over a 10 meter walk? What do they do in their daily life? Like how do they walk to work differently or not? Do they choose to take the subway or not? Do they abandon their car and bicycle for these technologies? We don't know. So fascinating. The space is, yeah, the space is enormous. Um, when you start to think about time and spatial scale. I think yep. those of us that have been doing this for a while s see this and, and appreciate this at an intuitive level, but our field tends to be put in a box, um, which is that, you know, we're trying to develop these wearable robots. It's early days. It's nascent technology. It's unclear whether or not it's worth investment if it really benefits people, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's really cool that you are pushing uh, the, the boundaries and kind of uh, demonstrating the, the sort of universality of these principles and their broad uh, applications. You mentioned uh, Hemotech and, and our system. So you, you were one of the first groups uh, that we worked with on uh, one of the sort of bigger, more complicated versions of CapLex uh, with multiple modules. And, and you work in this interdisciplinary multi-PI center, which is, is great. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, without this getting overly promotional, if you could talk a little bit about <laughs> that uh, experience yeah. uh, with the system, the different ways you've been able to use it and, and, and others as well that you've collaborated with sort of how, how has it kind of expanded uh, the possibilities and accelerated the R&D for you? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the accelerated part is, is, the, is the part that's really been useful to us. And it helps us answer very, I guess, focused questions on what the controls should do. So, and this is really sort of on the time scale of things we're talking about here and now. Uh, a person who is a naive user gets in a device, what should the device do? And should it do different things in different contexts? Those are the kinds of questions that we've been using the Hemotech to answer. And the reason we like it is because we don't have to worry about all of these, uh, what will be important to autonomous systems. Uh, things like the mass of the actuator, does the device fit perfectly? How does it fit for each participant? Is, are people getting too sweaty? All of those sort of very applied sort of tactical questions go out the window. And we were able to focus very carefully on exactly what the exoskeleton should do. So one, a couple examples of that are we use the caplex around the hip. This was Ben Schaefer, who's a former PhD student in, in my group that I co-advised with Aaron Young, really to understand whether or not a, a semi-active or pseudo-passive approach at the hip on an exoskeleton could be effective at reducing metabolic cost. And we didn't want to build a fancy semi-active or pseudo-passive system. We wanted to just uh, conceptually emulate what it would do if it were designed well. And we were able to determine that it, it could be useful, which then is like an an important first step to double down on investing and in building the autonomous device, which, which we're planning to do, or which we might partner with another lab who's better at building things, or it could be a company. So it's incredibly useful for like the early conceptual prototyping, not of the me 
mechatronic system, but of the controller concept. And for us, that means emulating things that could be built without motors. So it lets you imagine systems that are that are made from springs and dampers and clutches without having to build complicated mechanisms. Another place we've used this is in, uh, this is work of Kinsey Heron, who is a, a senior clinical scientist in our group and runs many of our own projects, DOD funded work on prosthesis. So lower limb, foot, ankle prosthesis, she's been using the human tech system. And in this case, what's really cool about her work is she's trying to understand how a user clinician scientist trio would tune a device in the clinic quickly in order to make it most useful for for a, a person surviving a, a lower limb amputation. And so there, they're, they're not only, it is, they're trying to dial in the control, but they're uh, paying close attention not to just what the engineer thinks is the best solution, but what team including the user heavily thinks is the best solution. And I think that that's incredibly useful. So it allows you to sort of test bed these like real world scenarios where wearable technology is being tuned and iterate on it very quickly. So those are just two examples of how we, how we've used it so far. Um, we're planning to actually start moving into working on arms. I have a new PhD student who's going to be starting in January, and we're we're thinking about overhead industrial lifting and how providing extension torques at the elbow and the shoulders can help with that. And we're probably going to be designing our own end effector that can plug into the Caplex motor system, which is, again, incredibly useful because we don't have to worry about any of the hardcore mechatronic design. We can really think about the bridge to different movement contexts. In this case, we've never worked on um, anything besides lower limb before, but I've realized in the last five years or so with pushing from my smart colleagues who work in the upper limb that that's, that's a missed opportunity. There's, that, there's not enough on upper limb. Yeah, um, interesting. I, I, so I want to dig into all three of these, but I'll, I'll start with the the upper yeah. limb. It's it's good to hear you're you're getting involved. I, this area of the field seems very hot right now, uh, from my perspective at least, just in terms of like startup activity and real world trials that we're seeing. You know, of these types of devices being used in in the factory in the warehouse. Yeah, so. Uh, it makes sense uh, that there's a need, and you're you're the you're the person to help us better understand what's going on. There, there's sort of this inherent challenge in our field. Uh, and this is kind of approaching it more from the entrepreneurship angle. Um, you know, the developing products historically, you know, the past few decades has operated in this like move fast and break things type mindset. You know, you have the idea for the product, you raise a bunch of money to build the product, you put it on people and you sort of confidently assume it's going to work. But with these wearable robotic systems, there's just so many things that so many ways in which the products don't actually work. And there's a need to iterate very quickly, learn from what works and what doesn't, and kind of update the approach without breaking anybody, you know, without hurting anybody. Yeah. Um, and, you know, traditionally, you know, in sort of a non-academic context, um, uh, I don't know that we've necessarily learned as much about why these devices are working or why they're not. Um so, uh, yeah, um, I don't know, without giving away all of your, your uh, special ideas uh, about what you're about to venture into, could you, could you share a little bit about maybe your main yeah. hypothesis? Yeah, I mean, uh, just, well, I'm not sure it's, it's, as, it's as hypothesis driven as it is, hey, folks, you alluded to this, like, hey, folks, I think we need to slow down. I've always been that person that's okay with slowing down the pipeline to product uh, and choosing to understand what the heck's happening and why. And 
I don't know. I, I don't have any good examples of how that's led to a better product necessarily yet that I can think of. Maybe others are, would say, oh, we read a Swiki paper and that led us to change our design a little bit. And that would be great. I would love to hear that feedback. But for me, it's it's more about really understanding, again, in the upper limb, the injury incidents and the types of injuries are clear. The biomechanical loading that leads to those types of injury is still, I, I would argue, unclear. Mm-hmm. And so what we're going to start with is doing some biomechanics that might involve a look under the skin a little bit more than what we've seen so far in the upper limb literature. Again, with, you know, using computational modeling and things like this. And my, my, my still colleague at my former institution, Kate Saul is a leader in this area. And so I know a little bit about that just from having interacted with her, but so yeah, really understanding what the injury mechanisms are exactly at the tissue level and then applying that back to understanding how and how different types of assistance, whether it be passive or active, or what what does the torque profile need to look like to limit or to improve the safety factors on those things that we know matter. Like that's the level of, I guess, rigor and detail that I want that I want to apply to the upper limb. And I think we've done that. We've tried to do that in the lower limb. Mm-hmm. It'll be slow and potentially painful for people who want to see products, but I'm okay with that. I th- and I think if these things are happening in parallel, that's the best way. Like the company doesn't need to be doing the hardcore basic science and I don't need to be building the product. And that's sort of, I don't know, I've double, triple, I don't know, quadrupled down on that feeling over the last five plus years where am I making enough impact? Should I be building products? And the answer is like, A, I'm not good at it. Doesn't get me as excited as the basic science. And I think that if these things are adopted long-term, the questions that we're trying to ask now will eventually be asked and will at least have a foundation to go back and do them again, you know, with the products that currently exist. So that's kind of I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of the upper limb jump as a way to try that out again on a, in a different, in a slightly different corner of the, of the, of the wearables world, I guess. Neat. The way I see it, there's no shortage of people who understand, study, you know, the way that people, the ways in which people become injured. And there's no shortage of people who want to develop products, but there is a shortage of connections between the two worlds, you know, people that mm-hmm. can live in both and, and, and build bridges. So I think, you know, I think you're one of these people who, who can live in both worlds. And though it may or may not depend or result directly in, in, in short order new products, um, I sort of have, have faith. It's, it's a belief. Uh, that the more these worlds intersect, the more we will see the generation of actually useful products. You know, it's not just Mm -hmm. a numbers game. It's not like build a thousand products and hope one of them works. You know, it's much more useful, uh, I think, uh, to focus on, you know, core efficacy in the beginning and then slowly and steadily build upon a fundamental principle that is effective. Um, right. rather than, you know, trying to make a product that looks cool, more effective. Yeah. And I think these, these definitely need to run in parallel, right? Like we shouldn't be waiting around to build things and put them on people and get, get that, get that angle. Will they even wear it? Right. That is important, but eventually we'd like to know what that thing's doing to tissue strains, for example, or contact forces in the joint. So, um, I'm curious, uh, to get your perspective on a particular lower limb device that I know you in- invested a lot in the, the passive clutch based, uh, ankle XO, which I don't know, maybe you're sick of hearing about it, but <laughs> when I talk to young folks getting into the field, they read papers about this device and it's like, wow, you know, this, this technology was amazing. Uh, it was, it seems like it was pretty effective. It looks cool. Um, (laughs) this is the sort of thing that seems like, uh, from an academic perspective, 
no brainer that this could become a product. I'm curious if you can share a little perspective on like with this particular example, but maybe also in general, where you've pushed towards productization and, and maybe some of the barriers you ran into from, from where you're seating, seated, uh, seated, uh, and how this kind of, how you've kind of updated your approach, uh, today. Yeah. Yeah. Those are good questions. I mean, the first thing to say is that that device was not built to be a clinical, you know, game changer or, you know, help soldiers carry a bigger rucksack and all that. The original idea was a challenge. It was an academic challenge from, I can remember clearly, I think it was Art Quo or someone from the past, you know, from the dynamic walking community. Maybe it was even at a dynamic walking meeting, but I think it was an ASB meeting or something like this when I was still in graduate school. Said, oh, it's it, we think it's impossible to build a device that can reduce human effort with without motors. Like you have to, you have to do work to save energy. And a few of us in the audience, Steve Collins and myself and a number of others were like, that's garbage. Like this is a challenge, right? And so that's how that whole thing started. It was like, it was an effort to prove art wrong, right? Like it was like these really important, smart biomechanists say this is impossible. It can't be. And so that's how that whole thing began, okay? And what it turned into was a surprising result for all of us, I think. Nobody thought that was going to work. We had a student begin to work on it with Steve's help because I didn't know how to do the design parts. And our role was really to, to get the experiments going and you know get it all working in the lab. And the initial results that came out were like, holy cow, like this thing is... It seems like it's working, but it's only working on one person. Okay, so we get to do the full study. Anyway, lottie, 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 down the line, we figure out this thing is effective. But then, okay, you say it looks cool and it works. I guess that's true, but the looking cool part doesn't mean it's practical. So there was a, I would say, like the initial hurdles to moving that through patent phase to, say, a licensing agreement with a with a leading P&O company was that its form factor was kind of clunky. If you remember, the original device has this like wishbone moment arm that comes, pokes straight out of the back of where where your ankle joint is. And try walking downstairs with that. I mean, I almost, I took a header, I think. I grabbed the rail of the staircase. Luckily, the first time I tried to walk down the stairs with it, it gets snagged, right? So you can't, so automatically this is not a real world device in its current form factor because of things like that. So then you're like, okay. Well, and the other thing is the clutch mechanism that that we built. Super elegant and again, academic exercise. Can we do this without any wires connecting to it, right? Okay, we can't. But that's not going to be the product version of the clutch because it's hand-tuned for every individual in a very careful way in the lab. It's only timed well for one walking speed. We'd only tested it on a treadmill. So basically, no real world considerations up front. But yeah, we, we, we prove a principle that a passive thing can potentially be effective. Then further along, people are starting to realize that maybe metabolic effort doesn't matter as much as other things. And I firmly believe this now. We don't, metabolic economy is really not what we're focused on anymore. <laughs> it's more about that. Ba- it's things like balance and also just mechanical offloading of tissue for people who say are recovering from an Achilles tendon repair or something. So you could see how the the thinking was grand challenge, reduce metabolic effort without injecting any energy, demonstrated it, but there's really no real world practical use for that concept. It's a very, very small corner of what's possible with a wearable robot, right? And so that basically meant that it didn't go anywhere product wise and it's still kind of we're not really working on that i think um i would say elliot rouse's group at michigan is still keeping the fire going and they've solved things like changing the geometry of the spring mechanism so that it is more lean and closer to the body they've uh, appreciated the idea that metabolic cost isn't the end all be all and so thinking more about being able to size the stiffness to offload, say, the Achilles tendon in useful ways in a regenerative medicine or rehab 
technology context. And things that we've done are actually try to demonstrate that that thing might, how does that thing change stability? And the news is not good. It doesn't make you more stable to have a spring on your body. So, you know, you get, you get an appreciable performance benefit in one domain of locomotion at the expense of maybe losing balance, which again, the clinicians in the room, they were right. Like this thing is cool, but it's not a real world applicable system. And so now the challenges are, how do you take that principle, retain it, and then, you know, be a little bit more cognizant at time zero in your design process about uh, what do you do with that in the context of the larger facets of movement and in the real world and in dealing with all these other things, right? So it was kind of a, I don't know, tough pill to swallow at first. I just didn't understand. I was very... Uh, in general, I'm a very hyper-focused person. And um, that means I'm not a great entrepreneur, right? And it means I might not be the one who should be the only person in the product development room. So lots of lessons in there. Um, and I, I mean, I, I still firmly believe in the concept of passive, but we should be thinking about it in other domains aside from metabolic cost, A. Eh? And we should be thinking about how to build systems that people will, will wear and clinicians and others will, will use, B. And then C, you know, like how do we make that thing adjustable step to step so that it doesn't work for only one walking speed, for example. Yeah, those are, those are great points, Greg. You're approaching this from another angle too. Um, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the the kind of the paradigm around the clinician tuning the device together with the patient and the engineer's perspective. I wanted to circle back to the the second paradigm that you were describing, um, where the patient and the clinician are tuning the device together. Your sort of lessons learned in in device development are now informing. Uh, how we better use devices or better fit, tune, prescribe devices which are already on the market. This is near and dear to my heart, of course. One of the big applications of CapLex that we're working with the DOD and VA on validating is sort of a patient-centered test drive strategy uh, for for prescription. So I don't know too much about this line of work that you have going on Um could you bring me up to speed? Uh, what, what are maybe some of the big ideas? Well, I mean, so this work is is really Kinsey Heron's work, and so I'll I'll try to do my best to describe what what I think they're doing. It's a it's a collaboration between Kinsey Heron and Young Hee Chang, Georgia Tech. So the idea is whether I mean, the fundamental question that's underlying it is what happens if we give the controls to the user. So the first question you ask is not how the three team members interact, but if you give the controls to either one of them independently, do you arrive at different solutions? And the answer seems to be yes. When the clinician in the room is working with a power foot ankle, these are for people who have unilateral transtibial amputation, what they're looking at is the knee joint angle. They're using, they're not, they may not even be monitoring it with, an, with a sensor. They're using their, their eyes and their experience to look at how the knee joint is flexing and extending in early stance. And if you talk to a clinician, many of them have different opinions about which part of the gait cycle they're paying attention to. And it varies from clinician to clinician is the point. And that, that's an important thing. So they, let's say you give them the joystick or the iPad where they can adjust two things, something like the stiffness and the engagement point of a virtual spring, say, that's on the device, or it could just be the timing of the motor and the magnitude of the motor on the device. And they, they're going through this iterative process, and then they say, oh, okay, it looks good. So they get to a setting that might, that might be, let's just use fake numbers, magnitude six and timing three. Okay. So now it's like, well, what does the engineer in the room do? They're like, we know how to automate this. We're going to use a human in the loop optimization technique, which for people who don't know this just means we're going to measure something and try to make it large or small. We're going to try to maximize or minimize something that we think is important. 
we're going to see a real-time measurement of that in the control room while the person's using the robot. And we're going to, we're not going to just do what we think is the right thing. We're going to do what we know is the right thing. We're going to me- make their knee joint angle look exactly like it looks like for an able-bodied person of that same size, right? Okay, so that what do they come up with? They come up with different numbers for the timing and magnitude. And then the third thing you do is you're like, we should probably, and I'm saying this, I'm kind of giving lip service to what's been a big problem in the field is like, we've waited way too long to just give the controls to the user. You give the controls to the user and guess what? They're done in 30 seconds, not the 30 minutes it took the engineer's algorithm or the 20, 10, 15 minutes that it took the clinician. And their settings are totally different from the other two. And they have a smile on their face and they're like, oh, I want to take this home, right? So you see the, I mean, you've heard this all before, but I'm doing it for listeners. Like, this is the setup, right? (laughs) The setup is... (laughs) Yeah, and... It's so cool that you're doing this. I dabbled with this paradigm uh, towards the end of my PhD, but I I never really dialed it in uh, like it sounds like you have. So the question is, like, how do you get all three of those people to Mm. matter in the process? Or, 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 And is that even important? And so that's what they've been working on, right, is they've shown, I think, pretty clearly that depending on who you give the controls to, you get a very different answer. You get a, mm-hmm. you get a different preference, essentially. Um, and uh, and in doing so, the rating of the user uh, is highest for when they do it themselves. And so they're more likely to use it. So I guess the next questions in there are like, uh, <laughs> what, what's the right way to share the <laughs> input? To be to get to very quickly get to a solution that the user likes, but the clinician also knows from their experience might be good for them, and the engineer says is possible to apply on a product. Yeah, and the relative it's, weighting of these uh, three different perspectives might not be constant. I mean, in in my dabbling with this, some that's right. patients or some users will have a high degree of confidence in their own opinions. Um, while others will have less, for example. So yeah, it, it's uh, it strikes me that there is not necessarily an engineer's solution to this problem because it is all about, you know, the sort of relationship between the three different perspectives and uh, ultimately the the user's feelings about all of this. Um, I feel like this is this is timely for our, I don't know, just kind of where we are as a society in general. We are wrestling with big questions about how much we as a society should rely on on automation, on AI, machine learning to make decisions yeah. for us. Yeah. And some people are all in on this. Some people think it sounds like hell. Uh, <laughs> somehow we have to coexist. Um, and I, I think it's really cool that you're kind of dere- uh, deliberately tackling this in, in this experimental paradigm. Yeah, I was going to say also that I mentioned way earlier in our conversation, like the need for mm-hmm. cognitive scientists um, and people who are not mechanical engineers, but might be human factors engineers, meaning that they understand deeply how to how to build interfaces that let multiple agents make mm-hmm. decisions together and how best to do that and how and how that can be made more efficient and then it's funny that you mentioned ai because i wrote down in my notebook like ai like where this is going you could the engineer who wants to automate this thinks ai and they want they're going to treat each of these three stakeholders as an, as agents and they're going to do they might apply some game theoretic i've seen this in human human robot interaction world, not for exos yet, but the idea of using game theory as a way to mm-hmm. make everybody happy uh, in a scenario where they're, where it's constrained in a complicated way. So like there probably are ways to reasonably automate some of it uh, with engineering know-how, but 
there is still this sort of bigger ethical philosophical grapple which is like why why does it matter why don't we just give things to people that they use the way they want and make them happy and just leave them alone right like so i struggle with what the right thing to do is i think we just need to do more work to see to see what happens in these experimental yeah, I think setups it it, it, it just more. needs to be ultimately negotiated by different parties that you know respect each other um this is uh uh fundamental to to how we use all sorts of technologies and you know there 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 probably isn't one answer but there probably is a sort of a better mental model or like way of thinking than we're we're currently you know subscribed to so yeah this is not the stuff that engineers typically deal with or publish on but uh yeah it's it's uh it's necessary and i think yeah over your career like you've been really good at structuring collaborations sometimes uh pretty unconventional i'm, I'm curious if you can speak to words of wisdom on on collaboration both yeah. you know within your center I, I always love to work with people that um kind of live in and work inside a a, a very collaborative uh center within a, a a college or university or whatever but then also just sort of the serendipity of bumping into people at at conferences and bridging long distances and different disciplines uh, to produce surprising results. Yeah, collaboration's like my favorite, one of my favorite things. I have this secret goal to colla collaborate with as many smart people as I can throughout my career. And it's like, keep a count on the Google Scholar page of how long the collaboration cool. list is, right? So, <laughs> so, so for me, it's always been, I have a question I can't answer. Who's the best person at answering that part that I can't, I should figure out how to talk to them somehow. If it's go up to them in a meeting and feel small for a second and say, Hey, I'm Greg and you don't know me, but I've seen you, I've seen this thing that you did and it fits in this puzzle that I have. And would you like to talk about it? So it's, it's getting enough, mm -hmm. I guess, gumption to, and feeling enough. So it all starts with asking questions that you care about. It, once you do that, you, you're, and you try to push the question far, farther and farther, eventually you get to a point where you can't do it by yourself. And then you have to be, you have to identify who the best people are and you should look for the best people. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It doesn't matter if they're in Germany or in California or even on your own campus, right? And then you've got to like get the grit and gumption to go make a, to make a contact. Uh, and then it just gets easier to do that after you've done it a few times. And it, it's, it's for me, it's kind of mostly worked out like eventually, uh, a good example of this is Massimo Sartori to, I have a loose collaboration with where we we're working with a postdoc together on some things. And I remember it clearly like 2016 at a meeting in Spain that we both got invited to. It's the first time I'd met him in person, having a beer. And I'm like, dude, we really need to put like your open sim models on a chip and like put real muscles in it. And it's sort of, he was like, yeah, I've been thinking about that too, because I don't like my hill type models. And I really wish I could just drive my simulations with real muscles. And this led to, in my lab, like the idea of the muscle experiments. This is the rat, the rat and frog part of my lab, the muscle physiology part. It led, led to us developing that in a very different way. And then I kept talking to Massimo for, for, from that point on. And he's actually in his lab, like really working carefully on this long-term uh, tissue interaction idea that, and we wrote a review paper about it, the long time scale stuff. So like it's this, it's chance encounters like that. And um, knowing beforehand that that guy is, or, 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 or that man or woman a scientist is like amazing. And you, right. So that's like the general principle behind my collaborative style is just go for it. Identify the best person and shamelessly go for it. What do you do when you uh, run into institutional barriers? Uh, 
Like, what would be an example of that? I don't know. Maybe I deal with that uh, in the world of entrepreneurship more than you do in the more academic world. But Uh um, yeah, when when you have two individuals within two organizations that are excited to work together, that's great. But the institutions that they work for might not necessarily work well together. Uh, They may live in two ecosystems that don't necessarily mix i'm just curious your feelings on that yeah i mean i think uh, i think there's yeah i, I guess i've I, i've dealt with, with this sort of in trying mm-hmm. to get industry um collaborate formal industry collaborations going is difficult because everybody has you know there's ip and then there's contractual stuff and then there's oh we don't you know are there enough resources and things like that so that's Yes, you can run into that when it comes to formal exchange of like money and people's time and stuff like that. The way around that for me has been to just get more informal about it. Like no one stops you from writing a paper about something. That is not, there's zero barrier to that. Uh, Another good way to do it is to find a, to keep your antennae up for students that come through your lab that are interested in that topic and then invite that person to their committee or formally co-advise them so that's another way that you can create a collaboration that doesn't like need a formal agreement between a university and whatever the other entity is right so we have this rule in my lab now where everybody on their phd thesis is highly encouraged to invite an external committee member and the charge from me to them is invite someone who you want to collaborate with or who you want to work for or work with when you graduate and that's it's that's been incredibly fruitful because Again, no money exchange. The other person has to be willing to give free time, basically. But we haven't really. We it's not a lot of. It's not a huge amount of time. It's kind of up yeah, to this that. Is... Other than come coming to committee meetings, etc. So there's always a way. There's no rule that says you can't talk mm-hmm. to another person on the planet. So I love that. this advice. <laughs> You're like and the then, master of informal intera- interactions that translate into big ideas. Um, I feel like the first time we met, it was uh, it was over beer, um, and uh, yeah, you definitely blew my mind. So that's cool. Keep me in mind, uh, you know, if you have any students looking for an advisor. Oh, you guys are yeah, would love more externally to discuss things. Yeah. So uh, for for folks listening who might want to get involved in your work, either as a student or collaborator, or industry partner, whatever, um, just real quick. What's the best way to reach you? How can we find you on the internet? Oh, uh, we have a lab webpage at Georgia Tech. That's easy to find. It's it's if you just search Power Lab plus Georgia Tech plus Wiki, any two of those three words will get you there. And then there and then you can find my contact and just email me directly. Super. Do that. Um, and Greg, I was hoping you could uh, close this out with a call to action for our audience. Call to action. Yeah, I mean, I guess I have two thoughts on this. Um, one is for, I'll kind of frame it first for the product development um, enthusiasts among us. Like, eventually, show me that it works using scientific approach. It's okay if it's not, not immediately, but eventually, show with some scientific rigor that your thing does what you what you want it to. And I think I think that that's still not happening enough and this is not just my idea Uh, you know people like carl zelik uh who's a close colleague of mine and also you josh and your and your company and your work to date like are good examples of how to do this i think the trade-off is time and speed but at some point show show us the scientific money right because then your product's going to stand out it'll be worth your time for the scientists in the group Pay attention to real world applicability earlier. (laughs) All right. So this is not a one way street. Like we can all be better at what we do. And you could see that those two calls to action meet somewhere in the middle where there's like a very strong handshake and things are amazing. But yeah, I, I, I already shared the story of the pass of the unpowered XO and how, and how that didn't have a, a really shiny ending in terms of getting the real world applicability product development going. And that's because we were too hyper-focused on elegant science from time zero. 
So those are my two I calls. Let's, let's get busy, folks. There's a lot of work to do and a lot of opportunity. Well, thanks, Greg, for uh, spending some time with us. It's been insightful. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I wish we could do this more. Um, and I hope I'll see you around conferences and and meetings and and maybe maybe it's time actually for us to take visits to each other's place in the next I would love next that year. I'll follow up. See you Greg. All right. Bye. Cool.